And welcome back to You Regina 120. I am Jeff Cliff, and uh, this is a series of videos, if you haven't seen any of them yet, uh, of 120 things that I learned as a student of uh, computer science at the University of Regina. And so if you haven't seen any of the previous videos, uh, again, we're starting to kind of build a little bit on some of the previous stuff we've, we've been through, so I'd encourage you to at least check out some of the other logical uh, fallacy videos uh, in this series. But uh, today we're going to be talking about yet another logical fallacy. This is one of the more basic ones. It's called affirming the consequent. And so how this one is going to work, like the previous arguments, uh, we're going to start with the premise. mean A, then B, uh, and then we're going to have another premise, and so from A, then B, and B, we are going to conclude A. Now, this is kind of a beginner's mistake when you're trying to make a valid argument. Uh, at first, if you try to just make random arguments, eventually you'll, you'll find this one, and it'll look about right, because, I mean, you've already assumed A, you know, if A, then B, uh, so it's reasonable, or seems at first blush reasonable to conclude A. Of course, this is not actually valid. Uh, if you try to conclude A from these two particular premises, uh, you will uh, lead yourself astray. So this is something to watch for. Uh, and not only is it valid in just basic you know, propositional logic, uh, but this is also true uh, when dealing with probability as well. Uh, it's going to look something like this where if you know the probability of B given A, and if you know the probability of A, you know, if you try to conclude that you also know the probability of A given B, you will be mistaken. Uh, you need a critical third piece of information if you're going to conclude that you know this, which is the probability of B. We're going to explain that in a later video, but just to know that you can probably derive this from this. Uh, so just to keep that in your mind. Uh, so here, here's kind of the, the general way of dealing, like a, as mentioned before, each one of these logical fallacies or each one of these improperly structured arguments has associated with it a valid and I guess well formatted argument uh, that is logical and you can use. Uh, and this is no exception. That there's actually two or three different ways you can change this to make a valid argument, and so we're going to show you those three now. The first one is by adding the word only. Although I don't really know the, the symbols or the syntax to kind of show this. Uh, the, the, the idea here is that if you have A, then B, B, therefore A, if A is the only case where you can acquire B, where, where B is something that you can only derive if you have A, if, if B is something that can only be caused by A, and you have B, then and only then can you conclude A, which makes sense if you have looking at our Venn diagram, if the only case where you can find B is within A, and you have B, then you can conclude that you're also in A. However, if you have any other situation, for example, something like this, then that's not the case, where it's possible in this region here, that you can have B, but not A, in which case you could have something that made this argument not true, which is means that the argument itself is not valid. So, uh, but generally, if you if you only if you kind of affix only to the first premise, then you no longer have this invalid form. That's one way of 
getting to a valid uh, argument of this form, starting from that particular logical fallacy. The second is to change the second premise from B, i.e. the consequent, or, or the, the thing that's being caused, to the uh, antecedent, or the, the thing that, the if part of that first premise. If you change this second premise to A, then your the two premises you have are A, then B, A, which means that you have then B. This is a valid argument. This is a valid way of deducing B. If you have, you know, if you have the argument, if it, if it is raining, then I am wet, and it is raining, then logically, I am wet, right? So you have kind of this first thing that sets up this condition, this thing where you know you're you're saying that something follows something else. You have the first thing, therefore you have the second thing. That is about valid use of if-then logic. It is how if-then works. Uh, there is another way you can take the original logical fallacy and make it valid. So let's just review the original logical fallacy. starts out being A then B, B therefore A, which is not valid. If we change the second premise to a not B, that's what these little hooks represent, is not. So you have A then B, not B, you can validly deduce from that not A. That is something you can do, it's allowable by the rules of logic. Uh, we can go through and prove this later on, and we probably will. Uh, but, again, this is different from the first and the original uh, form, which was a logical fallacy, where this did not have a not on it. So it wasn't valid. Again, so these these three things, kind of affirming the first thing instead of the, the second thing, uh, putting a not on the, the second premise, and inserting the word only, those are the three ways you can kind of convert your, your, your invalid argument to a valid one. Let, let's look at some examples to kind of clarify in, in using concrete examples uh, what how this actually works. So let, let's draw this uh, logical form up again. Okay, so reading the internet today to pull from some examples. Uh, if my eye drops were in another dimension, then I couldn't find, or I wouldn't expect to find them on my bedside. I did not find them on my bedside, therefore my eye drops were in another dimension. Okay, how far out and how stoned do you have to be to believe that your eye drops are in another dimension? Really. There's a lot of different places your eye drops could be, including your pocket, including in, you know, someone else's pocket, a thief could break into your house and steal them. There's lots of ridiculous ways that a small thing can disappear, such as a, a bottle of eye drops. Another dimension is not the most likely explanation. Sorry, glitch in the matrix guy. Let's try another one. If God answers my prayers, then this tumor will, you know, go away or be benign or benign or whatever, however you pronounce that. You know, the tumor is going away, therefore God answers prayers. Again, you know, there's a lot of tumors that go away on their own. Not, maybe not even most of them, but some of them do. And over the, the entire human species, there's enough of them that do that, you know, occasionally you may run across someone who gets a cancerous tumor and then the tumor goes away on its own. It happens. It's, it's a, a good thing when it happens, but again, it's not necessary that there's this one explanation for that particular tumor that is this God making it go away. Sorry. Uh, here's another one. If God created the universe, we should observe, or then we should observe, order and design in its function. We observe order and design in its function. Therefore, God created the universe. Again, th this is another example where you're kind of missing something in that this first one didn't state 
that there was no other way that a universe could be structured such that there's order and design in it. That's not to say, you know, if you're a theist, it's not to say you couldn't make that argument. You could. There's nothing keeping you from saying, you know, here's an argument that God is the only way that the universe can be structured such that it has order. That's not what this initial statement said. It said, if God created the universe, then we should observe order and design in its function. Okay, so that, at least that particular argument, is not a valid one. It's leaving out things that could explain order and design in a universe that have to be stated if you're going to argue with a, I guess, logical form. Here's another one. If telepathy is present, then we will get uh, better than chance results from an experiment that tests for telepathy. We got better than chance results from an experiment with telepathy, therefore telepathy is present. This is actually an interesting one because I've been involved with a, an experiment that tests for some forms of telepathy. And we even got some results that were a little, uh, it, it wasn't uh, something that we could just discount. Uh, you know, we, we did the, the, the good scientist thing. We, we set up a double blind experiment or at least a single blind experiment and, you know, actually tested some hypothesis. And, you know, this is like practically anything you can do in science. You know, you, you set up the experiment, you do it the best you can, and you get a, res you know, a result of the experiment. Regardless of whether it's telepathy or not, you get this result that, you know, suggests that there's this greater than chance uh, result of something that you don't expect happening. You know, do you conclude that the, you know, cause your, 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 testing is the only cause? No, of course not. Uh, that is not an appropriate thing for any experiment to do. Uh, and indeed, in our experiment, we do not conclude that there is some form of telepathy present. All we conclude is that our data does, you know, doesn't support the opposite. Uh, it doesn't support you know, the, the, the absence of it, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with doing experiments and getting you know, things that suggest um, Unlike, or unlikely events. There's a uh, cute little XKCD comic of, uh, if I remember correctly, t testing jelly beans for its association with ADHD, and you get like 20 trials, and one of the 20 uh, ends up testing positive, and so the newspapers look at the one that tests positive and claims, you know, scientists find link between ADD and purple or green jelly beans or whatever. Again, it's 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 inappropriate to to lead to that conclusion based only on the positive results of one study. And part of the reason is because of this, because you're basically getting this this part of the, the if-then uh, you know, as your second premise, and you're concluding from that that the only cause is this you know, first part. So uh, hopefully this is a, an encouragement for you to be a little bit more careful when you're concluding things, you know, so that you don't necessarily jump to conclusions unless your data supports it and that you won't be careful that if you're going to conclude things based on an if-then situation, that you look out to see where that only is, and if that only is in the right spot, and if you're actually doing so in a way that doesn't involve affirming the consequent. If you have any questions about this or would like to see more examples, because they're easy to find in this case, uh, feel free to ask for them in any comment uh, thread where this video is posted. Uh, this video is for your benefit, the listener and the watcher, so uh, Hopefully you enjoy. See you next video.